Good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Is this too loud? No. No. Okay. It's a solitary business, writing a book, sitting for a couple of years up in the garret, struggling away through thick and thin. So it's a, a real pleasure to get a chance to show it off and talk about it after all that time. Um, this book actually is, although it took me roughly two years, fairly full time to write it, it's actually the product of uh, 45 years since uh, in 1971, suffering from a bad case of hepatitis, I was lucky enough to come across a book called Zen Microbiotics by George Osawa. And this book offered the promise of uh, improving health and maintaining health through following a simple natural foods diet based on yin-yang principles, East Asian medical principles. And, and um, that was deeply radical for the time. It's hard to believe that in 1971, the suggestion that diet could affect cancer in any way was regarded as sacrilegious. It was deeply unscientific. In fact, microbiotic books were seized from bookshops in London by the police for making exactly that claim. And if we look nowadays at the World Health Organization's cancer website, you see diet listed as uh, I can't remember either the second or the third most important cause of cancer. And that uh, beginning for me led into the study of Chinese medicine, which I practiced for 30 years. And during that time, I developed a growing interest in, in the causes of disease and in the Chinese tradition of health maintenance. And that's what the book is about. It's about the two and a half thousand year um, teachings of how to maintain health and prevent disease. So according to this tradition, there are, there are three main factors that determine how healthy we are and how long we live. The first is constitution. That's obviously what we inherit from our parents and our grandparents. Some of us are lucky enough to be born with a particularly robust constitution. It means we have a strong body, um, lifelong tendency to good health, rarely get disease, can drink and smoke and party with minimal effect, and probably live quite a long life. Others at the other end of the spectrum are born with a weaker constitution, uh, tend to get ill much more easily, might have much less stamina, uh, can't burn the candle at both ends, and most of us are somewhere in between. The second factor is luck. Um, I'm just going to say now this talk is advertised as 20 minutes and I tried really hard to compress 450 pages into 20 minutes and I couldn't do it, so it will go on a bit longer. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Maximum 40 minutes. If you've had enough, just leave. So the second factor is luck. We're not responsible for our constitution. That's luck. Uh, we're not responsible for where we're born, what the economic, political, social conditions are. We're not responsible if we're born into poverty, which has lifelong effects on people's health. Um, whether we suffer wars and epidemics and um, oppression, whether we're born into a family that is kind and loving or uh, unloving, doesn't hold us, doesn't touch us, um, is abusive in emotionally or physically, this is luck. And it's really important to recognize that this is also a significant factor. But although these determinants of health and sickness, that's constitution and luck, are really important, they can be modified by lifestyle. And lifestyle is the third, or behavior is the third great factor that determines whether we're um, ill or healthy. And that's what this book is about. Um, the Chinese name of this tradition is Yang Sheng. That means uh, the nourishment of life. Yang means to nourish or to nurture. Sheng is life. And its purpose is to maximize our chances of living, of enjoying 
good physical, mental and emotional health, of enjoying life, uh, of living to a healthy, ripe old age, and ultimately of dying well. That's also part of the tradition. And it discusses every aspect of human life. Um, I'll run through the, basically the chapter headings in the book, but there are four key ones which are, com can be compared to the legs of a, legs of a chair. When a, leg, uh, a chair has four sound legs, the chair is stable. Lose one leg, it becomes unstable. Lose two legs, it becomes more unstable. So these four legs of the chair apply to everybody at all ages. And we need to maintain or pay attention to all of them. Um, the first is cultivating the mind and emotions. Uh, the second is regulating diet by paying attention to what we eat and what we drink. The third is cultivating the body by balancing the right kind of rest with the right kind of activity and exercise. And the fourth is sleeping well. And we often find that people who follow health behaviours who are kind of committed to good health will be good at two of them or three of them. So quite often people exercise very well and eat very well, but maybe experience a lot of stress and emotional um, chaos even. Other people pay a lot of attention to being mindful and uh, meditative, but neglect to exercise or don't eat well. So those are the four legs of the chair. And ad additionally to that, this tradition, the nourishment of life tradition, pays attention to uh, sex life, having a healthy and rewarding sex life, uh, paying a special attention to lifestyle during pregnancy, childbirth, and the weeks after childbirth, caring for children wisely, um, cultivating ourselves by enjoying nature, art, and music, and dance, and managing the aging process as well as possible. So from its very earliest days, Chinese medicine always emphasized that prevention is better than cure. There's a, a pithy Chinese saying, medicine can only cure curable disease, and then not always. So once we develop chronic disease, it doesn't matter what kind of medicine you follow, Western medicine or any other kind of medicine, it's very difficult to cure it. The best one can do is manage it. So the 2,000-year-old Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine, which is called the Bible of Chinese medicine, in chapter one said the sages, that's the wise people of old, remember this was written 2,000 years ago, did not intervene when people were already ill, but when they were not yet ill. They did not try to put in order what was already in disorder, but tried to prevent disorder from arising in the first place. Treating disease after it has arisen is like starting to dig a well when one is already thirsty, or only starting to cast weapons once the battle has begun. Would these not be too late? So just a couple of words where this tradition comes from. Um, it, it derives from uh, the three main philosophies of China, principally Taoism, that had the biggest influence on the nourishment of life tradition. Secondly, Confucianism. And thirdly, Buddhism. Um, it comes also from traditional medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's influenced by the martial arts tradition, particularly the internal martial arts, and practices such as Qigong and Daoyin. And also significantly from folk knowledge, that rich repository of human wisdom passed on generation to generation, which is nowadays often dismissed as old wives' tales. So next, what, what is it that marks out this Chinese tradition is special? Why should we pay particular attention to what I think is one of the most complete and wisest understandings of, of human health? Well, there are a number of factors um, I'd mention. The first is, there is within those three philosophical traditions no real belief in an afterlife. This life is what you get. This flash 
of life in between an eternity of non-being before we're born and eternity of non-being after we die. And therefore, we should enjoy it and make it last as long as possible. Secondly, particularly from Confucianism, we inherit this body from our parents. It's the loving embraces of our parents and their care for us that makes our life possible. And they in, they ter they in their turn receive their life from their parents. So we owe a debt, the Confucians, Confucianists believe, we owe a debt to our ancestors to regard our life and our body as precious. Thirdly, we find in Chinese history and culture, unusually, very unusually, I think, compared to any other ancient culture in the world, a pretty uninterrupted tradition of medicine and um, health cultivation. There was no dark ages in China. There was no takeover by a religion determined to wipe out pre-existing knowledge. You basically have the handing on of wisdom about human life generation after generation for two and a half thousand years or more. Fourthly, very strongly influenced by Taoism, is the idea of following nature, the natural way. And this makes sense of um, so many problems that people seem to be confused about <laughs> nowadays, particularly with regard to health. It's a very basic principle. And so um, there are other core principles that underlie this tradition, which may seem strange to people who are not familiar with them, but as you become familiar with them and study them, they deepen, they become more and more rich, our understanding develops. So one of these is the idea of free flow. That, that is actually a definition of health. When everything is flowing freely in our body-mind, we are innately healthy. The second is the idea of harmonising yin and yang in our life. And if there's time, I will try and point out a few examples of how deeply meaningful this idea is. Third, the wisdom of the middle way between extremes. Fourthly, stopping before completion, which sounds a bit strange, but I'll try and give you a couple of examples as we move on. And finally, as I said, following nature. And all, these, all the key points of the Yangsheng tradition are basically ordinary. They're very, very ordinary health behaviours. They're not fundamentally esoteric. They're not expensive. You don't have to go off to the Himalayas to buy your salt and your spirulina. It's just the everyday stuff that we do. And one of my favourite quotes from a 19th century Chinese doctor, Fei Bo Xiong, which is, I hang on to in this, um, in this age of the new age, shall we say, there exist no miraculous methods in the world, only plain ones. But the perfection of the plain is miraculous. So it's the cultivation of ordinary stuff that has a great effect. And an example of this is um, a UK study of over 20,000 Britons that assigned one point each for four very, very basic health behaviours, much more basic than the tradition that I talk about in the book. So they're simply not smoking, being active, that means exercising regularly, consuming uh, low to moderate quantities of alcohol, that means not being teetotal, but not drinking to excess, and eating at least five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. So those people who followed all four health behaviours lived 14 years of healthy life, longer than the people who didn't. Next, a word or two about why I think this tradition is so important. Well, first of all, it's important for us personally. There's another Chinese saying, before 30 years of age, you bully disease, but after 30, disease bullies you. So even if we're healthy, young, strapping people, in our late 20s, early 30s, the body inevitably starts to decline. We lose muscle bulk, we lose brain cells as the body ages further, um, bones weaken, sinews weaken, 
organ function starts to reduce. As we get into our 50s and 60s, we start to get uh, increased likelihood of heart problems and lung problems and digestive disorders and so on. Okay? This is an inevitable process of aging, except for the fact that we can significantly modify this. A person who cultivates their mind and body, a 60-year-old, can be healthier in most ways than a 30-year-old who doesn't. And we also know that you can improve your health and strengthen your body at any age. It's never, ever too late to have significant effects. And I just want to stress, when I make statements like this, as anybody who's looked at the book will see, every single statement I, made, I make is backed up by verifiable, masses of verifiable research, more than you want to know. Um, but it's not just about us. Uh, what the world is facing, among its many problems, <laughs> is a, an epidemic of chronic non-infectious disease. If we look at the incidence of the main chronic diseases, that's diabetes, cardiovascular disease, dementia, cancer, strokes and depression, they're increasing in every country of the world. They're increasing in the developed world, but they're also really majorly increasing in the developing world as Western lifestyles are spreading. So all those diseases are expected to double or treble in incidence over the next 30 years. And that will produce a crisis that no health service, however well-funded, will be able to cope with. So the future of medicine inevitably has to be prevention. Okay, so I just want to give a few examples from some of those key points. So I, I'll try and talk a little bit about cultivating the mind and emotions, a little bit about diet, a little bit about exercise, and if there's time a word or two about nature. So most people are very familiar with the idea that if we want to be healthy, we have to exercise well, we have to eat well, and so on. But it's interesting that this Chinese nourishment of life tradition places the mind and emotions first and foremost. So why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, there's the ancient observation stressed constantly through the tradition, that chaotic and unrestrained emotions harm the body and mind. Acute anger, chronic anger in the form of frustration, uh, addiction to excitement, uh, anxiety, worry, chronic fear, shock, stress, all these eat away at our happiness, eat away at our vitality, and physically injure the body. Secondly, um, unless we work on ourselves, can work on ourselves and, and find some level of integration, it's very hard to follow good health behaviours. We all know about making resolutions and then find we're doing exactly the opposite. Look at the, the rash of gym memberships in January. Look at the number of times people decide to stop smoking, stop drinking, um, take up exercise and so on. So we often undermine our own best interests because we're split internally. So we need some level of integration um, in order to look after ourselves. The great 7th century doctor Sun Tzu Miao, so famous in China that he's referred to as the god of medicine, said whenever people don't live out their lives or their life is cut short, it is always caused by not loving or cherishing themselves. The third reason that cultivating the mind and emotions comes first is that when we can foster in ourselves positive mental and emotional states such as generosity or gratitude, contentment, friendliness, laughter, all of these benefit health. They benefit our physical and emotional well-being. And the Chinese explanation of this is they promote free flow. When we're happy, when we give to people, when we laugh, this promotes free, what's called free flow of qi and blood. Qi is a 
word difficult to translate, usually translated into English as energy. Now, Western medicine doesn't have chi, but it has blood. We have 60,000 miles of blood vessels in the body, major ones and minute ones, because every cell of the body has to, has to be reached by blood. So what helps blood move in the body in Western medicine is really important, and that's basically flexibility of the blood vessels and the ability of the blood vessels to vasodilate. That means to open so that blood can flow freely. So when we look in Western medicine and what factors um, promote um, free flow of blood, vasodilation, we find relaxation, meditation, laughter, free self-expression, sex, alcohol, and tea. <laughs> um, fourthly, the fourth reason to cultivate, we need to cultivate the mind and emotions, is that without developing compassion and understanding of the problems that others, other people may face that we don't face in our own lives, then the search for health can become deeply narcissistic. And I think we all see the evidence of that in people's preoccupation with buying <coughs> products for themselves and being ex excessively preoccupied with their own personal well-being. And it's always worth remembering um, that the Nazis were big into natural lifestyle. They were big into open air, vegetables, exercise, and all that kind of thing. So without compassion and love and friendliness, this is not a positive uh, way of life. And finally, um, however well we look after ourselves, we're going to get old and we're going to die. As some American guy said, health nuts are going to feel stupid someday lying in hospital dying of nothing. <laughs> and it, it's only through the cultivation of wisdom that we poor humans who, are, who live our lives knowing that this is going to happen, knowing we're going to get old and knowing we're going to die. It's only through the cultivation of wisdom that we can perhaps find some way of embracing that and accepting it. So how do we cultivate the mind and emotions? Well, the core tradition in the cultivation, of, in the nourishment of life teachings is meditation or mindfulness or uh, Broadly, when we talk about meditation and mindfulness, it doesn't have to be necessarily sitting in quiet meditation. It can be, for example, those forms of internal exercise, like um, the internal martial arts, like qigong, like yoga, perhaps like pilates, I don't have experience of it, where the mind is fully absorbed in the practice and not running on a treadmill watching television. So, so the mind and the body are fully absorbed together. And what we now know from extensive research is that we have what are called plastic brains. Our brain is not fixed. And when we meditate or when we practice mindfulness, certain regions of the brain can grow. And those are regions associated with uh, what they call emotional self-control. The ability to have a, a pause between the blind rushing into an emotion that we're familiar with and a pause within which we can decide whether you want to follow that or we find a different way of responding. There's a nice quote I like from a 17th century book called How to Relax. It says a man, well, a person, excuse me. It says a man who has trained himself goes through his daily business and contacts with people with possession of mind. He's never hustled when busy and deals with problems simply and clearly. All thinking and all deliberations come from this calm and poise, a state of complete rest from vexations when one can call oneself master of a situation. And my observation of people who want to cultivate themselves spiritually is they have a tendency to want to, to seek the light, the blinding light, the revelation, the intense experience. Whereas I think for most people, cultivation of the mind and the emotions works best when we learn to develop emotional resilience and stability as a starting point. 
I think that's probably more important than any of the other blinding emotional and spiritual revelations. Okay, um, I'm aware time is running fast. I should apologise, I'm used to giving six-hour lectures. <laughs> and <laughs> Just a word about diet. Chinese proverb, taking medicine and neglecting diet wastes the skills of the doctor. So we live in a crazy world with diet. We live in a world characterised on the one hand by hunger and on the other hand by overnutrition. Uh, the fact that most of our food is no longer real food, um, it bears little resemblance to traditional human ways of eating. Food quality is declining, the macronutrient and micronutrient um, content of food declines because of modern uh, varieties of um, vegetables and, and so on and modern farming methods. And a million opinions are shouted into our ears every day about the benefits or the harms of fat and the benefits of superfoods and detoxifying and paleo and high carb and low carb and, and so on. And for many people, the simple pleasure of eating and sharing food with friends has been contaminated by uh, obsessive dieting, fear and guilt about food, the whole naughty but nice thing, um, obsession with what's called clean eating and so on. And um, although two long chapters in my book are devoted to diet, I'd just like to pick out from this great complex mess of stuff two or three very key points. The first, I'm going to quote somebody you might know of, a guy called Michael Pollan. He's an American writer on food. He coined a seven-word dietary maxim, which is as good as any. Um, eat food, not too much mostly plants. So when he says eat food, what does that mean? He says food that our grandparents would have recognised as food. And that rules out, what, 80%, 90% of what we find in supermarkets. And not too much. This is the key primary message of dietary teaching in this Chinese health tradition, is eat less. Every Chinese person knows the saying, when eating, stop when you're seven-tenths full. And we know that caloric restriction, restricting the amount of calories we consume, is the single most effective way of preventing disease, preventing chronic disease, and lengthening one's life in every animal species studied to date. Okay. But you don't have to count calories. I'm not going to tell you how you do it. You have to read the book. <laughs> no, you just have to um, allow yourself to feel hungry. You get up from a meal when you're still a bit hungry. You're not afraid of the fact that you're hungry. You sit down to the next meal with real appetite. That means even the simplest of foods taste really delicious because you really need them. And then you stop eating before you're full. And the other really important part of diet dietary teaching is how we eat is probably as important or even more important than what we eat. Yeah? So quantity, uh, not eating late, never going to bed, well not never, nothing is never. Trying in general not to go to bed with a full stomach, eating slowly, eating in a relaxed way and calmly, sit down to eat and so on. These are very, very ordinary, old-fashioned Victorian values, if you like, but these are honed through millennia of human experience of how to maintain a healthy digestion. And people often eating very expensive organic foods from Infinity Foods, but their eating is chaotic. And it's probably better to eat crap in a very ordered way. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say a word about one other principle. There's a diet taught uh, in China, particularly when people are ill, which is called the Qing Dan diet. And Qing Dan translates as light and bland. What it means practically is that the foundation, or it is thought that the healthiest foundation of human diet is what are called light and bland foods. And these are basically cereal grains, vegetables, and pulses. 
and a few others like mushrooms and seaweeds. Yeah? They're not richly flavoured, they're not hypernutritious, they form the foundation of the diet. And then we add into them, we add to them foods which have what are called whey. And whey means richness, flavour, highly nutritious, like fat, like meat, like fish, like dairy, like sh sugar if you eat it, like vinegar, like soy sauce, and so on. And the rich foods form a much smaller part of the meal. So if you look at a traditional East Asian meal, not a feast, an everyday meal, you've got a bowl of grain with small amounts of whey foods on top. And the relation between how much of this rich, nutritious food we take and how much light food depends on things like um, do we live in a cold climate or not? In a cold climate, you need more rich, nutritious food. In a hot climate, you need less. If you're a young teenager, you need loads of <coughs> nutritious food. If you're an old person, you need less. If you're doing physical manual labour, you need more rich, nutritious food. If you're doing a sedentary job, like I guess most of us are, you need less, and so on. And drink tea. <laughs> That's the other. Tea is the single tea, by which I mean the um, leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant. Not, I'm not talking about herbal teas, are indisputably, I mean, tea research in the last 20 years demonstrates that tea, for some miraculous reason, is the single healthiest drink that you can take. It benefits pretty much every cell and every organ in the body. Um, exercise. Sun Tzu Miao, I quoted him before, the great 7th century doctor, said, if people exercise their bodies, the hundred diseases cannot arise. And I found this lovely quote from a 3rd century encyclopedia, Chinese encyclopedia. Going out, one uses a chariot. Returning home, one uses a sedan chair. People love these for the comfort they provide but they should be called mechanisms that make one lame. So human beings have always moved, almost constantly, and we're designed for it. Hunting, gathering, traveling, chopping wood, kneading bread, pounding grain. I mean, my granny used to wash all the sheets in the house by hand, and all, everything was done by hand. This used to be how human beings behaved, and nowadays, most of us have very, very minimal activity at all. And even in those days when people worked incredibly hard, they still found time to, to dance for celebration, for pleasure, uh, and to um, engage in competitive sporting and martial activities and so on. So this is constantly emphasised in the Chinese tradition that we have to keep the body moving. And the, and the, um, the saying that runs through this tradition is flowing waters never become stagnant because they're always moving. But it's equally emphasised we shouldn't exhaust ourselves. We shouldn't exercise to the point that we become really fatigued. And this is called stopping before completion. In the same way as we stop eating before we're full, we stop exercising before we're exhausted. Why do we do that? Well, we now know from exercise research that people who exercise too hard are less active throughout the 24 hours than people who exercise moderately. They get tired, they think, oh, I'd rather take the car than walk, I'd rather take the lift than climb upstairs, I've done my gym for the day. Yeah? So the aim for exercise is to reach a state where you feel really energetic and vibrant and you really want to walk. That is what you'd prefer to do. You'd prefer to climb up the stairs. Um, I go in the book into quite a lot of detail about the difference between the modern um, exercise tradition, which I think, wonderful as it is in many ways, is incredibly shallow and narrow in the sense that it's primarily, primarily concerned with muscular strength, and aerobic fitness, and I compare that to the East Asian traditions, which I think are probably the richest exercise traditions that humans have ever come up with, 
which emphasize things uh, such as flexibility, um, restoring and maintaining elasticity of the fascia, the connective tissue, developing sinew and bone strength rather than simple muscle strength, working with complex movements, spiraling and twisting rather than very linear movements, which running and cycling do, and, and a lot of gym equipment does. Um, developing full body awareness, so we're really present, fully present when we exercise, and um, integrating body, mind, and breath. And I would like to say more about exercise, but I think time is short. Um, I'm going to quote this 60-year-old Chinese guy. It says, because the principle of exercise, the key thing about exercise is do it. You just have to do it all the time. It says, when I exercise, I feel that my body is healthy. My mood is carefree. My life is happier and healthier. My energy is charged up and I save medical costs. If you can move, that's a big thing in China, by the way, nowadays. If you can move, you should exercise. With exercise, you definitely have to keep it up. If you're not steady, then it will certainly be useless. In the winter, I too like to nestle in my warm quilts. But as soon as I think that it is for my health, for my body, I then climb out and go do my exercises. So that's the simple principle of exercise. Above all else, whatever it is you do, do it every day. That's how we benefit. And if in doubt about what exercise to do, then the answer is to walk. Walking is, is arguably one of the very best exercises. Hippocrates said walking is man's best medicine. I'm going to wind up by just saying a few words about uh, connection with nature. I said that Taoism was one of the greatest influences on the health cultivation tradition. And Taoism places human beings within nature as part of the natural world. And that's very different from the Judeo Christian attitude, which placed humans as the pinnacle of nature with dominion over the creatures of the world. And we know where that's got us. Yeah. Um, here's a quotation from a 16th century Taoist text. Um, actually, actually, maybe Confucian, the way it starts, because you'll see what I mean. Everything from ruler, master, husband, wife, and friends, to mountains, rivers, spiritual beings, birds, animals, and plants, should be truly loved in order to realize my humanity that forms one body with them. And then my clear character will be manifested and I will really form one body with heaven, earth and the myriad beings. Now however modern we might feel, our biology is ancient and we evolved in nature. And so nature research over the last a uh, couple of decades has shown that our health and well-being are utterly dependent on our uh, encounters with nature. I mean, this was first demonstrated in the study of people who were recovering from gallbladder surgery in two wards in a hospital. Those people who were in a ward where they could see one tree out of the window were distar discharged from hospital one day earlier and used fewer painkilling drugs than people in the ward next door that looked out onto a brick wall. Just seeing trees, seeing plants, smelling nature, putting our hands in the soil, these have very profound impacts on us. We're ancient beings connected to the natural world. And the more that we harm and destroy the natural world, the more we harm and damage our own health. And um, just today in The Guardian was uh, uh, another report that the rate of global warming in the last year has exceeded anything that even the most pessimistic scientists predicted. Um, just to mention a fourth century uh, 
Taoist guidelines, 108 rules for the behavior of priests, monks, and laypersons. For example, you should not wantonly fell trees. You should not wantonly pick herbs and flowers. You should not throw poisonous substances into lakes, rivers, and seas. You should not dry up wet marshes. You should not disturb birds and other animals. So this connection with the natural world, the Taoists have a, a word, zeran, which is difficult to translate, but it, it, uh, my understanding of it translates roughly as spontaneously self-serve. Okay. So however wonderful the utilitarian linear designs of the city are, and I know we have one architect here, and they are wonderful, they are beautiful. There's something in us that responds to the spontaneous expression of form that appears in nature. It's not designed. It comes about spontaneously. The Taoists have no God creator. This is just the Tao expressing itself in all its variety. And our connection with that is vital for our well-being and our health. So, when I wrote the chapter on nature, I thought, and, and spelled out in the last part, the challenges facing us, I thought I'd better end on a positive note. And it took me a very long time. I, I didn't feel, I, didn't, I couldn't really see much positive vision, to be honest with you, but, you know, we, needs must. It was Winston Churchill said, personally, I'm something of an optimist. I don't see any point being anything else. So we, should, we might as well be optimistic. So what I wrote is, what is being called for is an evolutionary change in human consciousness. For the first time in the history of Homo sapiens, sapiens, sorry, we're required to act as one in response to a problem that endangers every creature on the planet. If we can rise to the challenge, Perhaps we can also find ways to respond to the many other health, environmental, political and economic challenges we face. Thank you. Thank you.